My name is Alex Hounser, and today I'm going to be presenting on hypersonic thermal protection systems. Due to the inherent speed of hypersonic vehicles, um, hypersonic thermal protection systems are needed to prevent damage to the vehicle due to high post shock boundary layer temperatures. Uh, these thermal protection systems can be ablative or reusable. I will be comparing these systems in terms of how they work. So the fundamentals, materials, cost, performance and usage, modeling and testing. Starting off with the fundamentals of ablation, um, I'm gonna cover three main things. The char layer that forms, high releases gas that is generated and the top char layer that ablates. So the top char layer that forms is a carbonized layer. Um, it's the top surface of the TPS that is essentially burned from the high temperature of the boundary layer. It's naturally porous and its structure is strongly material dependent. Uh, the structure of this material strongly affects how um, the thermal protection system is actually cooled. Um, and that cooling actually comes into play with the next topic of pyrolysis gas. Um, this pyrolysis gas that is generated uh, stems from the virgin material under the char layer um, and it is formed via sublimation or the transformation of the solid material to a gas. Uh, this gas is diffused upwards through the char layer, cooling the char, um, and this is known as transpiration cooling. Uh, this pyrolysis gas further mixes with the boundary layer, reducing the overall temperature. Um, and finally, um, the final step in ablation is that the top char layer blades away. Uh, it's mechanically removed, exposing a fresh cooler layer uh, that can actually take more temperature. In addition to all three of those things, um, ablative materials are typically cooled via surface re-radiation. Uh, this image here depicts everything that I just showed. Uh, you can see the red layer is the virgin layer. Uh, and this is where the pyrolysis gas stems from. It moves up through the pyrolysis zone where it accumulates um, pyrolysis gas and this gas moves or diffuses through the porous char. Uh, the rest of the image depicts all the different forms of heat transfer. Uh, it also shows a mechanical erosion, which is the ablation itself. Now moving onwards to reusable materials. These are sometimes called insulative materials just based on the fact that um, the main way in which they work is holding onto heat. Uh, while it's undergoing these high heat loads and whatnot, it's really not getting rid of any of that energy. It's actually storing this energy. The only way it's disposing of this energy is uh, via re-radiation. Um, so high emissivity coatings is a, is a huge thing for uh, reusable thermal protection systems. Um, and the energy that is sucked up by these thermal protection systems um, is only depleted when lower Mach numbers or lower boundary layer temperatures are reached. Um, and then the TPS can finally release all of this energy via convection or radiative heat transfer. I have another picture that essentially depicts everything that I just said. Um, it's much simplified compared to ablation, obviously. That sums it up for fundamentals. So now moving on to uh, specific material properties for each uh, type of thermal protection system. Um, despite having differences, they do share some commonalities um, and some of these commonalities or desirable material properties uh, for thermal protection systems in general are high emittance, low density, low thermal conductivity, high heat capacity, and durability. Uh, low density is important because any weight savings when going to space is super important. Low thermal conductivity, so that high or hot uh, boundary layer temperature cannot make its way um, to, the, to the vehicle surface itself. So it's just these thermal protection systems are very bad at um, conducting heat effectively, which makes them um, good at protecting the vehicle. So now more specifically moving towards ablative material, some uh, desired material properties is having a sublimation point lower than the boundary layer temperature. So as previously stated, uh, pyrolysis gas and transpiration is a huge means of uh, cooling for ablative materials without having a sublimation point below the boundary layer temperature, that is not possible. Uh, having a high enthalpy of fusion is important and also a high vapor pressure is also important. Having a high vapor pressure is important because it will allow 
the diffusion process of transpiration cooling to occur faster, creating more cooling. Uh, and due to all these uh, material properties, it's, it's hard to find all those in one. So uh, ablative materials are typically composite uh, but most contain phenolic resin or some sort of si silicon resin um, because these help form uh, the char layer. Uh, reusable um, materials also have specific material properties. Uh, and one of these cool ones is having a low surface catalyst C. So due to the high temperatures in the boundary layer, uh, molecules disassociate. Um, and as they move towards the TPS surface, they want to uh, essentially reassociate or recombine. So low surface catalyst C helps mitigate this because that reassociation actually generates more heat. Other common features of a reusable thermal protection system are that they are typically silica based. They have open porous structures, high internal gas content, uh, both points two and three help with having a low thermal conductivity um, and lightweight, which is shown in point five. Um, but sadly, uh, these reusable materials, since they're silica-based, are typically susceptible to damage. <clears throat> um, and that kind of sums it up for materials. Now moving onwards to cost. Uh, cost is obviously a very important variable to consider because we're going to space. Uh, this is something that's not cheap. It's very hard to get there. You can see with uh, legacy um, space vehicles, it was very expensive, upwards of a million dollars for um, the Vanguard, uh, but you can see as time has gone on, space has reduced in cost per payload kilogram. Um, and TPS cost is often dependent on fabrication material and insulation, so manufacturing cost, materials and inspection. So that's very important for reusable materials along with the number of flights seen as 0.4. Um, and then finally, payload displacement or the weight of the thermal protection system also directly affects cost. <clears throat> so ablative materials, how they affect costs, where they reduce and increase costs. So ablative materials typically reduce cost uh, because the installation is typically less complex when compared to reusable systems. It can be highly automated with like convergent spray technology. Uh, they typically increase costs when it comes to weight because they do typically weigh more. Uh, you can run through this example. Uh, I went through some basic calculations on how much it would cost um, in addition of cost per kilogram for the shuttle to have an ablative heat shield made of PICA, which is a low density ablator uh, compared to its actual reusable heat shield. And I calculate about $6,000 per kilogram of added cost with an ablative heat shield. That's just in weight. Um, now considering reusable, thermal protection systems, they typically reduce cost in terms of weight since they are so lightweight uh, and reusability. The more flights uh, will allow you to distribute that initial cost over um, many, different, many different flights. However, they typically increase cost with assembly. Uh, they are very complex typically, whereas the, such as the, the space shuttle having 20,000 tiles, it required extensive assembly and testing. Uh, maintenance was difficult. Uh, and it is not an easy process to automate. In addition, maintenance also adds to the cost. So they are reusable, but between flights, they do require inspection and other maintenance such as waterproofing. So the shuttle on average required 40,000 hours uh, and that significantly added to the cost of the thermal protection system. <clears throat> now considering performance and usage, this chart, um, lays it up pretty much all out for us when reusable versus ablative systems would be used. On the left, you can see uh, the case of the shuttle is where reusable TPS thrives. Uh, so this is typically where we have lower heat loads and heat fluxes. So lower, lower overall velocities and lower altitudes. Whereas you can see some of the deeper space explorations, um, they have extremely high velocity, especially near the Von Kármán line. And it takes a lot of time to actually decelerate uh, and this, uh, this leads to high heat flux and high heat load. So I've already touched on pretty much everything that's on the slide, but it is interesting to see that ablatives can be used on rocket motors. Uh, they can typically be used to replace complex cooling systems, which is pretty neat. Um, 
It's often used on missiles too. So for hypersonic speeds at low altitudes, think of increased density, which would increase the heat load. Um, uh, they can also be used for ballistic missiles with extremely sharp re-entry um, angles. Uh, ablatives are also extremely reliable and that is typically why they are used. Now considering reusable, again, this was covered initially on the first slide, but again, they are convenient to use when you have an extremely large windward, large windward surface such as the space shuttle because they are so light, they help save so much money. Uh, the shuttle also performed very well. It was able to keep the body, the aluminum body of the shuttle um, less than 350 degrees Fahrenheit when it was seeing boundary layer temperatures exceeding 3000 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, However, its performance was again um, affected by gaps between the tiles or this extremely complex assembly. Um, so little vortices would form affecting the aerodynamic performance in addition to the, uh, the heat transfer characteristics as well. Now moving on to modeling. So modeling is widely used obviously as an engineering tool uh, to help design things. Um, it helps eliminate guess and check frees up design space by eliminating some conservatisms as well. Um, now we'll consider ablation since it is the more complex of the two to model. Uh, it's extremely hard to model with high fidelity uh, just because there's so many things going on. Um, so many assumptions are typically made. Um, but with that said, a high fidelity model for ablation will typically include surface recession, surface temperature, char layer thickness, uh, and vehicle surface temperature. Those are like the most important things to care about. Um, and I found a simple 1D analysis that I kind of went through. Um, and I'm going to kind of explain it here now. So this research paper uh, coupled a flow solver. So the DSMC solver. So this is a way to obtain uh, free stream quantities of a rarefied flow using the Boltzmann equation um, with a conjugate heat transfer analysis. And you can see the 1D heat transfer equation below. So it includes a transient term and then one incoming flux and two outgoing. Um, so those fluxes are explained here. So we've got the convective flux, the heat flux due to pyrolysis and uh, the heat flux due to transpiration cooling. Then I go through and describe the, uh, the boundary conditions that were used. So we assumed only incoming flux was convective heat transfer at the TPS uh, surface that is interacting with the boundary layer. And then the TPS surface interacting with the vehicle surface was assumed to have no heat flux. <clears throat> um, and it's also important to note that with ablative models, you have to account for uh, changing material properties. So you can see XC down here uh, can be used to describe any material property. And it's dependent on the term epsilon and epsilon is uh, dependent on the temperature of the TPS itself. Um, so obviously these material properties change from being a virgin, which is uncharred material, and they move to char as they, they get heated and burned. Um, and that will change all of the material properties. However, modeling reusable systems on the other hand is much more simplified, obtaining the free stream quantities is actually the most difficult part. Uh, once you have all of your flux terms, you can really easily model uh, reusable TPS using the thermal resistance model. Um, without uh, testing, um, which is what we're gonna talk about now, um, we would not be able to use the engineering models that we have. So a huge part of uh, hypersonic testing is to validate these models that we're making. Um, another huge uh, portion of testing is to validate new materials, so material characterization. Um, and some of these material properties might be heat of ablation or surface catalyst. <clears throat> uh, and test methods are actually typically shared between uh, reusable and ablative uh, systems. They might see different heat flux um, and heat generation terms, but they can be facilitated the same way. And one of those big ones is the Holloman Air Force Base. So it's actually a, a rocket powered sled that can reach hypersonic speeds on earth. Um, and this is pretty cool because the free streams well characterized, uh, velocity and pressure is known and it's realistic, uh, but they are typically limited to transient data in nature because it's hard to have a track long enough to facilitate a full blown 
uh, hypersonic sled test. Um, a more widely used method is arc jet testing. It's extremely flexible in terms of uh, velocities, temperatures, and the gases used. Um, and that is why it's so commonly used. It's just so flexible. Uh, you can pretty, use it, pretty much use it for any problem you have. Uh, and then, so right here, I just have some cool pictures of an Arctic test on the left and the Helaman Air Force Base on the right. So in summary, uh, thermal protect protection systems exist in two forms, and these are ablative and reusable. Uh, they are comparable to one another, but different in many ways. And the way I did this comparison was through comparing their fundamental, fundamental ways they work, materials used, the cost, performance and usage, the modeling and the testing of each system. Uh, thank you for your attention. Please let me know if you have any questions. Thanks.